Hello, hello! David Snowpick here from Snowpick Games. Welcome to the stream. If there is anyone out there, please say something in the comments so that I know that you're there, that I'm not just talking to the void. Um, yeah, how is everybody doing? Uh, I, you know, last week was my first stream in, uh, at least a month, I can't remember anymore. <laughs> uh, and, uh, I didn't hear about how anybody else's projects were doing. Uh, so, please let me know. Let me know how your projects are going, what's going on. Ah, uh, yeah. Hey, Ricardo, how's it going? Um, by me, I mean, it's been a super busy week with, uh, work and things. Hey, Baked Grands, welcome to the stream. Hello, sorry for following me. Oh, promotion. Brr. Spam. The spam has arrived. I don't, do they, why do they always seem to show up at like the perfect time? Like, do they wait for someone else to say something and then, then they say something? Cause like they didn't say anything in the five minutes of, um, you know, lead in. I forget. Do I have a way to delete them? I think I do. Yeah. <laughs> You're gone. You're gone. Whoever you are. I don't even know anymore. Cause I blocked you. You vanished from reality. Um, but yeah, uh, not a ton has been going on by me, uh, other than I've been like breaking my brain trying to figure out how to, how to do the AI, uh, for the enemies in this game. And I think I have a thing, but we'll get into that in a minute. Um, what did I write on my thing? Oh yeah. Uh, Godot 4.3 development has opened and things have been, uh, really kicking off. I don't know if this stuff happened last week already, but like, uh, there were a whole bunch of rendering things that got merged uh, because they were like ready before 4.2 was released, but just couldn't be merged because the feature freeze. For example, um, all this wonderful, wonderful MSAA stuff that uh, Bastian worked on a bit and I worked on a bit. So we now have, when I can find it, uh, we have MSAA in the compatibility renderer. And uh, that includes web. Uh, Bastian did all of the non-web stuff, and then I just contributed a little bit of web stuff. And then uh, also, we have um, MSAA in WebXR. This was like the biggest downside I kind of felt to WebXR support in Godot 3 uh, was that we didn't have good anti-aliasing. Like you could use FXAA in Godot 3, but it's blurry. And like, usually when you use FXAA, you do like a post-processing sharpening step afterwards to get rid of the blurriness, uh, but you couldn't do any post-processing in uh, WebXR anyway. So it was like, you just got FXAA with blur, which was just not comfortable in VR. But finally, it's, you know, still in, in Master Branch, not released or anything, won't be released until I guess April-ish. Uh, uh, May-ish, whenever we're going to do the 4.3 release. Uh, but yeah, I'm excited about that. Um, oh yeah, and uh, DirectX 3D support got merged uh, a little while ago. It seems like Wayland support's going to get merged soon. Um, so it's just like a lot of old pending stuff that's getting merged. And I know everyone's still like catching up on what Godot 4.2 is, but it's really exciting that uh, so many cool things are already getting merged. Of course, like at the end of like this week and definitely the end of next week, like everyone's going to be gone and all development's probably going to just really, really slow down until the new year. But I don't know, just exciting times, exciting times, folks. Um, yeah. So, oh, the other thing I wrote on my list is uh, for people who are into VR, Asgard's Wrath 2 is coming out today. Uh, if you bought a Quest 3, you would have gotten it free. Um, I am excited to try it. I have to say that I did not really like Asgard's Wrath 1. Like, I didn't play it for very long. Uh, you also got, like, it free with something or some other thing. I don't know. Um, so, like, when I was visiting my pa about a month ago, we put it on his uh, gaming PC and, 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 you know, did the VR streaming thing, Air Link, uh, and it just wasn't that good, <laughs> at least as far as we played. We played maybe two hours, 
And it's possible that at that point we're still like in some super extended tutorial because like supposedly Asgard's Wrath 2 is like a 90 hour plus game, which is crazy. I don't know if I can manage that. I'm going to try it. I'm going to try it. But uh, it, it just felt like in Asgard's Wrath 1, like the combat was kind of felt artificial and there was all these like things with like characters and like stuff that I didn't really get. And I don't know. But I'm going to try Asgard's Wrath 2 after I finish... Um, after I finish playing Assassin's Creed Nexus. Hey, The Glean, welcome to the stream! Yeah, you know, like, 4.2 is super exciting, Godot 4.2, uh, but I kind of feel like I've been using it for the last two months, and so this is old news for me already. Godot 4.3 is going to be amazing! <laughs> There's always the next one. Um, but yeah, so, uh, you guys ready to work on a thing? I wanted to um, to keep working on on this VR one. I guess kind of my goal here is I want to try and make a like solid like ten minute arcade experience um, and then stop. <laughs> I know it feels a little weird for me to be focusing on this like dumb jam game, but I just want to make something that's like fairly complete for a really restricted space and then like put it on App Lab. Uh, I did at one point in time have like this goal, like I'm gonna in six weeks I'm gonna put something on App Lab, and I never did it. Uh, so I'd like to like really put something on on App Lab, and I I think this could be a good candidate because it's such a small, um, a small idea. Uh, anyway, so probably for the next couple of weeks I'm gonna be working on this. I don't know if I'll keep working on it on stream, uh, but because I can't get it out of my head, that's what we're doing today. Um, so if you guys remember, my my plan for this game is to make something sort of like Galaga uh, style, but like reinterpreted for VR and taking it out of space. Um, part of the reason that uh, I'm taking it out of space is because uh, the theme of the jam that I originally created it for was vapor. So it needed to be in the clouds. But I actually think I, I, I like this style of uh, being in the clouds and, and piloting this biplane uh, and having that be juxtapositioned against some like robot bug-like aliens that I will eventually make or, or find or whatever. Um, and also I, I strongly suspect that the only reason it was ever in space to begin with is because uh, space is very easy to draw. <laughs> at, a, at a base level, space is a black screen. I know Galaga has stars or whatever, but like even that is super easy to draw. Um, so, you know, that's, I think, just an artifact of, of it being retro. And part of the reason, too, that it was in space is because I think it took a lot of inspiration from Space Invaders, which was probably in space for the reason I said before that, you know, blackness is easy. Um, little dots periodically is easy. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I, I like doing that, that stylistic switch. Anyway, if you remember uh, last stream, I was trying to figure out how to do the enemy AI, um, and I was really, really struggling. So things that I like about uh, the Galaga style AI and that I want to maintain is the way that the enemies like emerge onto the screen and do these like big swooping motions. We're already kind of past that phase in this stage. Let's go back here. So they like fly in, do these like uh, big curves, then they kind of go into Space Invaders mode over here, and then periodically they'll sort of like fly out and do something again. Um, and doing this kind of multi-phase uh, AI where there would be these different sort of parts, uh, I was really struggling with that. Uh, and I, we started using a state machine and messing around with it uh, over the past week. I just realized that a state machine wasn't going to wasn't going to work. It. Oh, I missed a, I missed a comment. The clean you mentioned Quest Link Steam released Steam Link VR. It's nice to have a solution that just works. Does it just work? Like I haven't tried it yet. Um, but like uh, Airlink and Virtual Desktop work real good. I guess I I'll, I'll have to try Steam Link uh, and see if the usability really is that much better. Um, but that is really cool that Steam did that because um, anything that could bring like the, the VR market right now is owned by the Quest. <laughs> there's like 20 million plus of them out there, Quest 2s. There's probably a couple million Quest 3s even at this point. After Christmas, I mean, the numbers will, will jump, I'm sure, as well. Um, 
and PC VR has been kind of on on a downswing. So anything that makes it easier for people to play PC VR, uh, I think is real good uh, to try and breathe some more life back into PC VR. Not that I think PC VR is will ever be the mainstream. It probably never will be. Just in the same way that PC gaming is not mainstream gaming either. Uh, but um, making PC VR games is so much more accessible than making other types of games. It allows for more innovation because uh, you can just you can just do more experimental, inst interesting things. You're not as constrained as you are on on a Quest device. Um, anyway, oh, and also like uh, sort of related but not related, the uh, Game Pass app just came out for Quest Two. Uh, I, I think it was two days ago. I tested it as soon as I saw the news uh, and played like GTA Five for like. 10 minutes or something just to test it out. I haven't had a chance to really like use it for a long period of time, but that is also really cool. It's not VR games, of course, it's flat screen games, but being able to uh, hide away somewhere else and play, you know, my Xbox games when my uh, uh, normal TV and that room may be in use for something else is kind of cool. Anyway, I've gotten way off track now. Where was I? I think I was talking about how uh, I was struggling with uh, uh, how to do the the logic for um, the the enemy behavior, and that a state machine just wasn't cutting it. Let's install the app. Type five digit code. Simple level. Cool. Use path follow three D. Yeah. So I have an idea that involves a path follow three D. I'll be getting to that um, for the curve part, but it really was more like the, the, the phases. So like, okay, so f I have to do the curve. That's one thing. Now they need to sort of fall into this grid over here. Then they need to periodically do these other behaviors and go back to the grid. Um, so what I ended up, uh, digging into, which I think is a good solution for that part of the problem, because there's multiple problems here. There's a lot of problems, uh, is behavior trees, uh, which are, not entirely dissimilar to state machines, except uh, broken down into much smaller pieces. So like a state and a state machine can be rather large, actually. Uh, you can bake any kind of thing in there. Um, and state machines also tend to be sort of like fixed function. Like you do this state, a certain amount of things happen, which means you go to this state or this state. You can't like reprogram them into smaller pieces very easily. Uh, so. Behavior trees, I think, might be the solution to that. Like, we can set up a behavior tree um, that says, like, okay, we have a sequence of actions. First, you'll seek this point. Then the next action is you'll follow this curve. Okay, then the next action is join the grid. And then the next action is wait a little while and then uh, start back up at the beginning kind of thing. Um, I, I think that that could be a good solution for that sort of behavior. Oh, cool. So what, what Wi-Fi USB dongle do you have for, for doing uh, uh, PC VR over, over Wi-Fi? I just have like a, a, a separate access point that's only for VR was my solution. Um, so anyway, uh, I, I looked at a bunch of behavior tree add-ons. Uh, I know Bitbrain has one. Uh, I, I looked at also this one, which is called Yet Another Behavior Tree or something like that. And decided to try this one first. Maybe I'll check out BitBrains at some point, or maybe I'll roll my own. I don't know. Um, and yeah, so that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking uh, what I would like to do as kind of a first pass is we'll have uh, an enemy that spawns, seeks a point, seeks the player, then goes back to some other point, and then uh, kind of does the cycle over and over again. And that will be a sort of first phase. Um, the the uh yeah we'll take it from there after that um then the other part of the problem which is what i think i got distracted the most uh towards the end of last stream uh was just figuring out how to do the movement um so not the logic but like moving from point a to point b um i had a kind of weird idea uh, on stream which i did eventually make work i didn't get it working on stream but like uh you know i came back to it in the evening and and did get that code working uh, the result wasn't that great. I mean, it essentially did what I wanted it to do. It would, um, you know, come to follow the player, but without making direct movements. It, I, the the logic kind of constrained how far it could turn, um, which would make it take these kind of wider arcs, which was cool, but not really exactly what I wanted. And the clean, I I spent a little bit of time 
looking at your code. I did not end up actually trying it uh, because I then got distracted by so many other things that I was trying to, to work my way through um, with the behavior trees. And then the other bit, uh, is which I, I'm trying for the movement now, which is uh, steering behaviors, uh, which are really cool. I had not looked that much into steering behaviors previously, um, but uh, yeah, basically, and th there's this series of articles uh, here, which were written in like, I don't know, 2014 or 2012, actually, um, that do all of their examples and example code in action script and like the little demos can't even run anymore because Flash is gone. Um, oh, this one doesn't even have a demo. Uh, but uh, really, really cool. Basically, you calculate a steering vector that gets applied to uh, your character's velocity uh, every frame. And the calculation of the steering vector is super, super simple. But because you're kind of applying the steering force rather than uh, directly calculating the velocity, you get those kind of arced movements that I wanted. But the more interesting thing is that you can combine steering behaviors. So you can have one steering behavior that is seek this point, and then another steering behavior, which is don't crash into other enemies. And all you have to do to make it do both of those behaviors at the same time is to add the steering vectors together, which is pretty cool. Uh, because I was thinking about, you know, if the, if the enemies are going to fly out, and then they're going to return to kind of this space invaders grid in the middle. I'll want them to pick up spot, go to a spot, but I don't want them to crash into each other. Like if you have a whole line of enemies and then they're going to go into these spots on the grid, how am I going to make sure that they don't intersect? Um, and with steering behaviors we can totally do that. We can make it so that it's going to a point or it's following a path, but it's also avoiding the other enemies. And so that's what I'm trying now for the movement. Um, yeah, uh, I looked at a bunch of add-ons for steering behaviors. There's a GD Quest one, uh, which I had looked at briefly when they first published their tutorial. I ended up not using it. Uh, I feel like it's maybe a little bit too fancy, like it's trying to do too many things. Steering behaviors like really are remarkably, crazily simple, like really, really simple. And I felt like their their implementation was trying to be too friendly, to do too many things, to be too sophisticated. Uh, so I ended up just making my own implementation based on the the action script code from this series of tutorials, um, which yeah maybe let's let's take a look at that. Uh, yeah, so we have um, this behavior tree. Behavior tree gets a root. Then there's this composite node, which is a sequence, which basically says do everything uh, that the children say as far as actions. Uh, I only have the one action right now, which is seek uh, point. Uh, where I'm just sort of assigning, I'm assigning a, a target point as a, a property here. And so a lot of this stuff um, is just things to do with the behavior tree. Uh, but the, the steering behaviors uh, made this little steering manager 3D. And um, yeah, so like in, in here, uh, basically every, every tick, this, this comes down to a physics process, a physics tick. Um, it's deciding, uh, it's updating its position based on this steering manager 3D. Um, there's a series of methods for like some different standard behaviors. In this case, we're, we're saying uh, seek target, uh, which again is crazy simple. You basically calculate um, the desired velocity, which is just you take uh, uh, you create a vector pointing from your current position to the target position, normalize it, and then multiply it by your speed. So this is like ideally you want to go this direction. Uh, this stuff is uh, to deal with what happens when you actually reach the point. But let's not worry about that now. The steering vector then ends up just being your desired velocity minus your current velocity. So it sort of is arcing you towards where you want to go. And then when we actually apply that to the uh, to the velocity, also really simple, um, we take the the steering vector, which is just the sum of all of the steering vectors that we came up with for all the different behaviors that we want it to do, uh, limit it to whatever our max steering force is, divide it by the mass such that heavier objects, you know, take bigger arcs, like they can't, you know, change direction quite as easily. Um, and we just add that to the velocity. It's crazy simple. 
and and ends up creating what seems like pretty rich behaviors, which is super fun. Set up his Comfast CF eight two one AC. So that's like that's like a a a uh, hotspot in a dongle kind of thing. Enable mobile hotspot on the Windows Wi-Fi settings. Windows Chrome. <laughs> Why isn't the target position in the blackboard? Ooh, good question, Ricardo. Yeah, so I did consider doing it that way, and I may do it that way um, in the future, that we could have two separate actions. We could have one action, which is like select point, and then another action, which is seek. And so then what we could do is select the point uh, in the select action, store it on the blackboard, and then the seek point would just grab whatever target was set in the blackboard. And that could maybe allow us to create some more sophisticated uh, behaviors. But... I haven't gone that way. Hey, Fallen or Zeus, Chesh. Um, yeah, the math is so simple, like dumb simple. Anyway, uh, l l let me show you kind of what, it, what it's doing right now, which is super simple. And also, uh, side note, I made a non-VR mode to make it easier to, to test. Yeah, so he, uh, right now the, the alien, which you can't really see because I'm just in a bad spot, uh, is just seeking to this arbitrary point. So it started here, and it seeked to that point, and it got there. Uh, so not very much, really. Uh, and I'm hoping on stream we can we can get to some of the sophisticated stuff, like the path following, like having a, a chain of enemies instead of just this one single guy here. So what I'm actually thinking for the um, the the like chains of enemies, like you see in. Uh, kind of the opening sections of, of Galaga, is drawing some path 3Ds, and then uh, rather than having the enemies actually be like children of path follow nodes to, to specifically follow the path, we're going to have each enemy create a path follow node on the path and then seek that position. So using the steering behavior to seek that position. And I think that will be really cool because uh, if something flies out and gets in the enemy's way, uh, and of course I don't have the evasion stuff hooked up yet, we can try and hook that up and see how it works, we'll see how far we can actually get on stream. Usually we end up not getting nearly as far as I'd like to get. But uh, it would allow it to both follow the point and evade other things that might be coming through, uh, which I think would be really, really cool. So, USB Wi-Fi card. Ah, okay. Yeah, that's the plan. That's the plan. So, uh, we have it seeking this first point, and since I was talking about it, should we just try to do the curve thing? Should we just try to get it set up to follow a curve? Um, I think, and this is all organized so badly, because this is like just barely beyond jam game status, and I probably need to spend like an afternoon just reorganizing where everything is, because it's getting a little bit out of control. Uh, but we just need to put somewhere in here the path. We don't want it to be part of the enemy uh, or its logic. Let's do path 3D. We want it to start at the same place as the target point. So there's a trick to this. If I put it on there and then bring it off. Uh, Logan told me this trick. And, um, oh no, I put on enemy spawner. I don't want enemy spawn. Or wait, where did I put it? There's this trick to make like one node inherit the position of another node. And I don't remember what it is. Did I do it? No, I did not. Okay, we'll just go old school and copy paste the transform. So the target point is at 1200 Y. And whatever I just copied of Z. And in this kind of large space, it's going to be kind of annoying to... Um, draw these points, but we can do it. So let's, maybe let's just start with figuring out the, um, oops, the uh, X and Z positions. And let's get these clouds out of here. They're kind of annoying. Where are you clouds? Cloud volume. Okay. Uh, I keep accidentally going out of orthographic. All right, so it starts here, flies to this point again. Uh, this is where the player is, so let's maybe have it fly, I don't know, around this way and come back, something like that. So let's add a point. How do I add a point? Uh, so maybe 
Wait, does do I need to put a first point or does a first point implied? Let's just put a first point because I, I'm not sure it's implied. And we'll sort of come out here behind the player and go this way. And we want to bend these a little bit. Um, no, I don't want to close the curve. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. How do I mess with the handles? Select control points. There's got to be some way to mess with the handles. Actually, I don't think it really matters, honestly, because the the enemy should kind of curve um, naturally. Uh, due to following the uh, due to following the steering behavior, um, so maybe like let's not curve the lines at first, and uh, just see what happens. So I'm just bringing the the Y position up to 1,200 for all of them. Since the way I placed them, they would have been placed on the ground, and now I'm going to come to the side. Uh, why is this all crazy? Did I make them all 1,200? I was a little confused as to why that one's way up there. Oh, there's multiple pages. Here we go. Okay, page two. 1,200. 1200, 1200, okay, so now they're all up there. Oh, and that's maybe too high. We maybe want this to be on, because the player isn't necessarily going to be up there. Uh, let's see, let's maybe make this a little more interesting. We'll fly down this way. I don't know. It's a good start. So maybe it would be better like this. Can copy and paste whole vectors in the inspector? How do you do that? How do you copy and paste whole vectors? Like, This will change my life, Ricardo. If I can copy and paste whole vectors. Okay, so let's say I want to copy my target point. Do I like click position and copy that? Oh, my life is changed. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ricardo. I had no idea that you could do that. I mean, I guess like it's sort of natural once I know that it's possible that that would seem like the way to do it, but I didn't think it was possible. That's really cool. I don't, I don't need Logan's trick that I can't remember. I can just do copy paste. You do not believe how many times I have like had two weird like uh, values in a three part vector and had to like copy and paste two times to bring the two parts. Wow. Okay. Okay, so seek point, uh, we're going to seek that point. Let's create a new uh, action here. We're going to call this uh, follow path. We need to make a new script. Uh, detach script, detach script. Um, oh, hang on, follow path action. And actually, I don't like the way I'm creating this. Let's start over. Uh, I'm going to instead do... Uh, BT action. This way I don't have to try and find the um, the path to the parent script. So let's do follow path action and then extend script, follow path action. Let's go look at my seek point. We're going to steal some code here. Um, So instead of a target point, we're going to have a path. This is going to be path 3D. If not path, no path. 
set to follow. Uh, and then we return a failure. So the, the whole failure success running thing uh, is pretty cool from uh, behavior trees. So when you have um, different types of collections of actions, uh, they will do different things depending on whether something's failure, success, or running. So like in this case, um, we're doing this sequence. So it will try this first one. And uh, if we say running, oh, okay, that one's running. We'll keep doing this action until it says success. And then it goes on to the next one. Um, and then if there's a failure, I think this type of sequence, the whole thing becomes a failure. I'd have to look into it. I, I haven't been using this behavior tree very long. Um, all right, so if there's no path. We don't do that. Uh, we need to track whether we have started following yet or not. Um, we're going to need a path follow node, which is going to be path follow 3D. Um, so I think basically we're going to have to say, if not path follow, then we need to create this path follow node. Uh, so path follow equals path follow 3D new. And we need to, does this need to be a child of the path? I forget how this works. It's been a little while. Let's go read the docs. Takes its parent path 3D. Okay, so it needs to be a child of the path 3D. So uh, path add child, path follow. And then uh, we need to think about speed. I think, oh, something that just occurred to me. We are dealing in really big values. Um, bake interval. The distance in meters between two adjacent cached points. Okay, this needs to be way bigger than 0.2 meters. Uh, otherwise, this path is going to take a ton of memory. So the uh, uh, enemies are like have a, a, a diameter of like 50 meters, and we're moving across spaces of hundreds uh, of meters. So this is way too many points to bake. Um, one meter, five meters, maybe five meters. We'll see. If it looks too choppy, we can always increase it. Uh, I really wish that there was some feedback in the editor about like how much memory does the cached uh, baked path take. Like That would be really helpful uh, for making this decision and for like warning people who may have accidentally created a path that takes some egregious amount of memory to store. All right, uh, back on track here. We need to add this, and then um, or maybe actually I'll leave the seek part in here. Yeah, this will be good. Um, we need to figure out our speed. So right now, the enemy has a max speed which is in meters per second. Um, that would be actor max speed. And we need to come up with a way to move the path follow node along the path at that same speed. So to do that, we need the length of the path, I think. Let me think about this. Um, Because I, I think ultimately we're, we're adjusting like a, a, a ratio, like a number between 0 and 1, I think, to say how far along the path it is. Uh, let's, let's look at the docs again. Progress. Progress and progress ratio. Wait, what is the units of progress? The distance from the first vertex measured in 3D units along its path. OK, actually, this is better. Uh, we don't have to think in terms of a ratio. 
We can use the ratio, I guess, to determine when we're at the end. But if progress is written in meters, then we just have to move the appropriate number of meters along this path uh, per second, right? So that would be path follow progress plus equals um, p actor max speed times uh, the delta, right? And in this um, in this uh, behavior tree, it gives us the delta on the blackboard, which I think is pretty clever. So I, I quite like some of the decisions made by this behavior tree. Like you can set in the root of your tree, whether it's called on the physics process or the process. And then regardless of which one you choose, it's going to give you the correct delta value on the blackboard. And you'll still use this same tick regardless of where you want to run it. All right, so this should move us, this should move this point along the path at the speed that the actor is meant to move. Uh, how do we know when we're at the end? Is the path going to wrap around or is it going to stop? Should mode allows or forbids rotation on more than one axis. Tilt enabled, V offset. Yeah, I don't think there's anything else in here that we necessarily need. Um, hopefully it'll stop when we get to the end. I guess we'll find out when we try it. But we want to say, um, uh, well, we want it to move before we call it the end, right? So let's maybe do our check. Um, if path follow progress ratio is a prox no no because uh, mm, prox ratio uh, let's just try equals one and see what happens and if it equals one then we're done with this action so we'll say um tick result uh success and we will also need to dispose of our path follow so we'll say q free and uh, path follow equals null. And then this will move us forward. Our steering behavior will target our path follow global position. We update our position. Uh, this is kind of a hack that I have in here for now. Uh, we just make the uh, the enemy point in whatever direction that it's traveling, which I don't think is what we ultimately want. I think we want to adjust uh, the the rotation uh, based on some steering behavior as well. Like um, right now, all the behaviors I have set up just affect position, but I think we should also have like an angular velocity that steering behaviors can affect. Uh, but for now, uh, we're just dealing with position and having it uh, look at wherever it happens to be going. All right, so the steering behavior makes it seek that position. We turn it to face the right direction and return running, which lets the behavior tree know that we have to come back here and keep running this one uh, every frame. So if we did this right, I think we should see our, our enemy come up, then follow the path around. And it probably won't work the first try because things rarely do, but let's give it a try. All right, so I'm gonna wanna go up so I can see this coming up here. It's reached the point and it's doing nothing. Ooh, debugger's going crazy. What do we have going on, debugger? No path set to follow. Oh, we never set the path. <laughs> Thank you, nice warning message. That was very helpful. Okay, path 3D. Now let's try this again. Second time's a charm. Ooh, now it's going this way. It was a very abrupt turn. Now it's going this way. <laughs> uh, 
That's not right at all. <laughs> what? What's going on? Can we draw the path in debug? Visible paths. I don't see the path, though. It's probably too small. Well, we can do our own thing. We can we can attach a, a mesh to the path, uh, follow nodes that we'll be able to see it. Add our own little debug in here. I mean, it's following something. I guess what it feels like is that it's perhaps following too quickly. All right, so let's set up our little debug. We are going to add to our path follow node. Let's make a mesh instance. And we're going to set its mesh to a, uh, let's say, box mesh, which is not going to be nearly big enough to see given just the scale of our world here. I think it's called extents. Let's um, see what the size on a box mesh is. Oh, it's just size. Okay. So size will equal vector 3. Let's make this be, I don't know, 25, 25, 25. That might be too big, but we'll see. And we will add this as a child to our path follow. You can detach camera and use editor camera by clicking camera icon in the editor when the game is running. It will give you a better perspective to debug things. So that works great when I'm using multiple screens. I mean, we could try it when I'm doing it all on the same screen. It's already annoying enough that I have to like switch windows to, uh, to look at VS Code. I honestly don't mind the um, the uh, flying the 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 plane that much. I mean, it'll probably get old at some point because uh, I really did a half-ass job of of bringing it into a flat screen game. Like it, it rather than just nur, 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 making the stick go all the way every time, it should kind of ease into it and all sorts of little nice things. But um, I also put the camera in a real weird spot when you're playing the flat screen game in, in VR, you're much closer up and actually have a wider field of view. Maybe progress should only increase if the target was roughly reached. That's, yeah. That's, that's uh, possibly what we need to do here, that maybe we're not getting to the spot quick enough. Although we should actually be starting at the first point yeah, there's a lot of things that, that could be going on here. Let's... There is actually a steering behavior, too, for following paths uh, that isn't related to path follow. Why are we not seeing our mesh? Well, here, let's try uh, detach the camera and use editor camera by clicking camera editor icon in the editor when it's running. So now we can do like this. Oh, wow, it's way up there. Um. But shouldn't it have gone to the same starting point? Let's, let's, where is our starting point? Our target point is here. Oh no, it's way down there. I must have moved it, not thought about it. Um, yeah, it's possible that this behavior should actually seek to the path starting point before it starts moving along it. And maybe that would fix our problem. But also like, this is just weirdly placed. Uh, so this is our target point, which was at 1200 and I thought we started all these points up at 1200 how did it get so far off 
Oh, I wonder if I didn't even need to do the 1200 thing because the the points on the curve are relative to the position of the path 3D. Maybe let's let's just set, set all these y values back to 0. I might have just been confused about what units I was working in here. Alright, so this does actually start at the right spot, and we can do a little bit to readjust the um, the height here. So we can make the path a little bit more interesting. Yeah, in general, this action probably should first have the player seek the starting point of the curve. And then we could actually have it not move on if it hasn't gotten close enough to the path follow, which would kind of make sense. So if we're imagining the ultimate goal is to have like a whole line of aliens uh, following this line, if one of them gets held up because it had to like dodge or something, would it try to go back to where it left off, or would it try to catch up? Maybe it would try to catch up, and then we wouldn't want it to stop. I'm not sure. Let's give this a try, though. Ooh, and now we can actually see our path. Which is good. Uh... What? Oh. Oh. I think I know what's going on here. I think the problem is in the behavior tree. Um, hang on. Let's... Uh, okay, so we have this sequence. It seeks the point and then um, tries to follow, but then goes back to seeking the point. I think what we need is a limiter to say only ever seek this point once. Limit one, include limit. Okay, so let's try this. Yeah, the fact that it wasn't progressing the, um, the node along the path. Interesting. So I guess that wasn't the thing. <laughs> so we limit it once. Does that mean it counts it as a failure when it tries it? Okay, save progression. Hmm. Let's try something else. Let's let's take this out of our limiter and change this to save progression. Uh, and if that doesn't work, we're going to look at the source code for the behavior tree and see if that can explain what's going on here. Oh, here we go. It's following the path. And I wish I could turn around, but my camera faces forward in this. So we'll, we'll see it come back this way. How far behind is it? It's a little bit far behind. It's like not keeping up that good, even though they should be moving at the same speed. Oh, and it's just going to keep going because that's how the behavior tree is set up. Or no, why, why would it keep going? It should fail at some point. Okay, I don't know if it's if it's looping because the behavior tree is just going back to the beginning, or if we have a problem in our code around the path follow action where it's not uh, it's not succeeding. I guess the opposite of failing, it's not succeeding at the end here. So let's say uh, path follow success. Get a little debug info out of here. But I think I mean fundamentally. This is doing what we want. It's doing it really slowly. Uh, in the game, I think we want the enemies to be moving much quicker than this. But it's following the path. It, it took a kind of arced movement there, uh, which is really what I wanted. The fact that we didn't put any, like, uh, curves into this path doesn't seem to really matter. Um, I mean, maybe in the end we should try it anyway. But the movement of the... Um, of the alien is pretty natural even without it. <laughs> okay, so it it does not 
succeed. Uh, we need to figure out a way to know that we've made it to the end. Uh, I'm a little curious, actually, what happens to the properties of our path follow node um, as it travels. Yeah, I I am. Uh, is the progress ratio overflowing? Yes, it could be. Is it resetting to zero or is it just going past one? That's an interesting idea. Let's try this real quick. Just changing that to a greater than or equals to one. Yeah, something I really want to do too, and I haven't tried it yet, so it may turn out to suck, but the idea of if there's a line of enemies and you hit one of them before they explode, they could go flying back a little bit. And if the enemy's steering behavior is such that uh, they're going to try and dodge each other, that could mean you knock one out and then the ones behind it kind of swoop around it real quick, which I think would make for a really dynamic feeling. All right, did we get a success? We did not get a success. All right, it's... I suspect that ratio is like automatically being reset to some value like just above zero. Let's um let's print some of these values out and see what we're dealing with here. We will print out the progress. We'll see if this resets. And we'll print out the progress ratio. All right, so it hasn't started the uh, the path follow yet. There we go. Now it started it, so we should see lots of stuff going on here. We're progressing meters. We're progressing ratio. goes to the end. Oh, oh, got to stop it because I got to see the numbers there. All right, so... Ooh, hopefully it didn't end up out of the buffer. Okay, so we're cruising, we're cruising. We're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And then all of a sudden, it falls back down to one. So what is the way to detect this? We can say... Um, if path follow progress plus, all right, yeah, let's calculate the increment. So we're going to calculate the amount that we're going to add to the progress, which is just this. And then we're going to say, if path follow progress, um, plus increment is greater than, I believe there's a way to get the approximate length of the path. I think that's on path 3D. It could be on the curve resource though. Okay, curve, let's get the curve. Baked into roll, baked, count, get baked. Maybe it's actually on the path follow node itself. Let's let's see. Hmm. I swear there's a way to get a, a length of the curve. Where did I miss it? In point out baked length get baked length okay uh so that's on the curve so let's go look in here uh so that would be path curve get baked length so this would mean the next movement would push us past and we are going to count that as a success and we will again print success Hello, hello, Brushkevich. It is going well. Disable the loop. There's a loop property in the path follow? Yes. We need to disable that. Loop. Okay. All right. We might not need any of this junk. The original code might work. Let me... Uh... Great catch the clean. So when we create the path follow, we set loop equals false. 
Hey, Gamma Games, welcome to the stream. Yeah, I didn't even, like, talk about that. Uh, stream number 99. I don't know if I'll do another stream this year because next week uh, is going to be right before the holiday and my kids are going to be off school on Friday. Um, so I don't know if stream number 100 is going to be 2023 or 2024, but that's a, that's a big number. Did you make custom processing event tick? Uh, so I am using this behavior tree uh, add-on, yet another behavior tree is what I think it's called, uh, which has its own custom tick function on the behavior actions, which will either run on uh, process or physics process, depending on how you configured your, your behavior tree. So yeah, it is, it is a custom uh, tick function, but not created by me, created by uh, this add-on that we're using. Okay, so we're not looping around. And I want it to print success when it succeeds. So we'll bring that up from the commented out bit. And let's see what happens. All right, here comes the, the enemy AI. It's following our path. And it disappears. And where the heck is our guy going? Oh, it's just, okay, now it's looping the behavior. But we should see a success. Ah, but I didn't stop it before it probably took it off the screen. All right, let's see if we can find the success message. Uh, okay, that was the beginning. We need the end, which is around 2,000 meters. Success! All right. Okay, so fundamentally, I think this is working. Um, what is the next step? What is the thing we need to do to take this to the next level? I think we want... I think we want the enemy perhaps to wait a little while before starting the loop again. And then I think... Well, no, I think this is, this is, this is, this is good for the moment. Let's try coming up with this way to spawn like a, a, a string of enemies. And then I think maybe we could experiment with the, uh, the behavior to kind of go into that space invader style grid. Is it hard to make VR games in Godot? It is not. It's actually quite easy to get started. Uh, we've been testing this, uh, in flat screen, uh, because we're doing AI stuff, and I don't need to put the, the headset on necessarily. Uh, but once we have a, a stream of enemies going, like I for sure am going to put on the headset and see what that feels like. Um, all right. So is that what we're going to do next? Should we make a stream of enemies? Uh, we have our enemy scene, which we're driving entirely by the behavior tree. And I've been spending a lot of time trying to think of how... Are we going to uh, create stages for this game? Like, what's the workflow going to look like? And I'd really like for the <clears throat> the workflow to be in the editor, so that we can do things like placing uh, these paths in three D space. So I'm not like having to put them in code or like a JSON file or some junk. Um, and so I, I was thinking that it could be a matter of placing these enemy spawner nodes, which I started working on. I'm not sure why it's a scene. Well, I guess I think I know why it's a scene, because I'm going to want to have a timer on it. Uh, but yeah, so I think the level design is going to come down to placing these enemy spawner scenes and saying, like, after four seconds, I want you to spawn ten enemies with, like, 0.4 seconds between spawning each one, and I want you to assign this particular behavior tree. Go! Uh, so let's make that. I, I started it, and by starting it, I mean I put one property on it. Uh, so we still have everything to do here. Um, I've made some notes about what properties I think it needed to have. Let me check that. Now, enemy spawner. So it's going to need an enemy scene. It's going to need an enemy behavior somehow. 
Um, how are we going to do that? So we could put the enemy behavior in a scene as well. But that gets tricky because we have uh, this target point and this path 3D are also part of this behavior. And I kind of think of those as being part of the stage, not being part of the behavior. How are we going to bundle those up? Lid 0 k welcome to the stream. I want to start learning game development. Which engine do you recommend starting with? Uh, so, I mean, I think Godot is really good for beginners, for sure. Um, and unlike other engines that might be good for beginners, uh, Godot also is capable of doing really advanced stuff as well. So you can kind of like graduate up the curve, starting with relatively easy things that are good to get started, and then like can go on to make full, rich, deep games. Uh, whereas if you were doing... I don't know, Game Maker, that's a little bit less true. I mean, certainly there are some like cool games on Steam that are made in Game Maker, but like Game Maker can't really do 3D or the 3D that it does is a little weird. Whereas in like Godot, it's like full fred 3D and like same kind of thing if you're going to do like Construct. Uh, great for beginners, but you can't really, you know, graduate up to that to that higher level. Um, so I think Godot is, is a good option uh, there. That said, some other options are easier for beginners. <laughs> like I think an absolute beginner would probably do uh, better in the beginning parts with Construct or Game Maker. Um, yeah, so I don't know. And start with anything. Start, just start. Just start. You'll learn tons of things. If you end up switching engines like three times, that's also fine. <laughs> you can learn uh, lots of things about lots of different ways of approaching uh, game making. Just, just, just get started. That's my advice. Um, yeah. So we should definitely have a scene that represents the whole level. It'd be really cool if it was easy to clone, like, this actual behavior tree so that we could, like, configure the behavior tree as part of the scene. I mean, another option is we make this, uh, take, like, some parameters... And then we're assigning it these things from the level. <laughs> level design workflow here. I mean, we could we could make some changes to the way that this behavior tree works and have it able to run the same behavior tree for multiple actors. Um, like the way that it works presently is you assign an actor to it, and then this behavior tree just does that actor, which, ah, yeah, that would be a big change to make. So it would be doable, though, right? Like, we could say, um, rather than storing this path follow as a member variable um, on, uh, you know, this GD script class, we could stash that in the Blackboard, so then, like, each actor that a single behavior tree controls gets its own blackboard but it's sharing this same you know whole node so i mean that that is possible it is an option if we rewrote the behavior tree to allow a single behavior tree to mechanize uh you know many actors at once I mean, the easiest thing to do would just be to make the target point and the path 3D be part of the behavior. I just really imagine that I might reuse those, you know? We might have the same path be used uh, multiple times and perhaps not by the exact same behavior. Yeah, and like, honestly... If we if we're creating if we make ten enemies and we instantiate a behavior ten times and each one of those behaviors includes its own copy of the path and its own copy of the target point, like we're making this path and this target point over and over again when we really don't need to. So 
So what is the best way forward here? I mean, just for the sake of getting things done, we could do that and just say, hey, who cares that we instantiated this path 3D 10 times when we didn't need to. And then move on. But I feel like if I'm designing a level, I'm going to want to see all of the paths for all of the behaviors like at once, right? Because, okay, so let's, let's go down this path a little bit. We'll say uh, we're making a, a scene. We're calling it level one. And we want, uh, I guess, even our spawner here. We're going to, or hang on. Before I go too far down this path, let's commit some things. <laughs> let's commit some things to Git because that makes it really easy to roll back if we need to. So we're going to add our uh, steering manager, which I threw into the add-ons folder thinking, hey, maybe I could make this into a reusable add-on, but I actually think I might go back on that. doesn't matter now. I just want to save it, just back it up. Um, so let's commit this stuff. Got following a path. All right. Um, so now that we've backed it up, I can just I can just cut just cut those things out of there, throw them in here. So now, where the heck is our path? Okay, so there's our path. If I'm designing this level, I'll want to be able to say, okay, I have this path that these enemies go down, this other path that these enemies go down, and try to like kind of relate them together. Um, and, you know, these different target points and, uh, you know, looking at everything that's going to happen in that level. Um, so I don't really want to have those be in the scene with behavior. So something I never do, because it almost never works, is clone pieces of the tree, like duplicate things. I think the method's actually called duplicate. Let's go look at this for a second. Duplicate. Duplicates the node, returning a new node. You can fine-tune the behavior using flags. Note it will not work properly if the node contains a script with constructor arguments. These are supply arguments to object init. In that case, the node will be duplicated without the script. C, duplicate flags. Duplicate signals, groups, scripts, use instantiation. Duplicate using instancing. An instance stays linked to the original so that when the original changes, the instance changes. Okay, we definitely don't want that. Um, So we could try doing that, where we point at a particular behavior tree and say, that behavior tree is going to be used here, duplicate it. I just have not had that much good luck with, with duplicating things. But let's try it. Let's try it. So we don't actually want an enemy here. We want an enemy spawner. Um, And how are we going to organize this? So this should take the enemy scene from here. Here's our little prototype enemy. And we're going to want to say, um, export var enemy behavior. And it's going to take a bt root and what else i have on my list we want to say how many start time and spawn delay so uh export var enemy count export var say spawn what do I call it? Spawn time, spawn delay, or start time. Start time. Uh, we'll say zero is the default. We'll just spawn right away. Uh, and then spawn delay. We'll say there's uh, 0.2 seconds between spawning each enemy. So to make that work, 
we need a bunch of timers. So this will be our start timer. And we also will have a spawn delay timer. Um, start timer is always one shot. Spawn delay timer is also going to be one shot. Basically, we're going to uh, start it each time that it comes up. I think because we're doing everything on the physics process, we'll keep that going here. <clears throat> So back to the code, we want to say, um, God, there's like some weird focus bugs with Godot that drive me crazy. There's some people actually working on them right now, and I, I certainly hope that this manages to get worked out. Uh, I should go make some bug reports <laughs> to try and contribute to, to the solution rather than just complaining about it. All right, so... We want to say if start time is greater than zero, then we are going to, or actually, hang on, let's let's make sure we have uh, each of those nodes in a variable. So start timer, start timer, and our spawn delay timer, spawn delay timer. I don't like that this is start time and start timer that there's a one character difference between those two things but we'll deal with it for now can't think of any better names uh so then we'll say start timer uh is it delay what is it called time left what is it called Ooh, this should be called delay uh spawn delay timer that got renamed uh because I was hitting keys when I was in VS Code, uh, trying to type here, uh, but because Godot still had focus, because it just likes to take the focus and never give it back, uh, I was actually sending my key presses here. That's the, the root of whatever that bug is. Okay, so this is wait time. Equals start time. And then we will start the start timer. If it's not greater than zero, then um, we want to do the spawn, but we're going to defer it. So we're going to say spawn, uh, which is a function we haven't written yet, but we're going to call it here. I'll just start it down here, spawn void. Then this function will be called either here directly or by our start timer. All right, now I know I have to do that to get my uh, <laughs> input focus back. Um, and then if uh, spawn delay timer, well, this always has to have a value. We'll just assume spawn delay timer wait time equals spawn delay timer. Sounds like single window should help. No, so, I mean, yes, I use single window mode. Uh, because there are even more issues in multiple window mode, but it it doesn't um, it doesn't help with the interaction between Godot and not Godot. So uh, when I switch from from Godot to VS Code, uh, it will sometimes not give me focus to VS Code, even though from all indications in my window manager, like VS Code will be highlighted like this, which is supposed to indicate that it's getting my inputs and uh, you know shown when this one is hidden, but my inputs will still be going to Godot. Um, it's, it's some X11 bug, like Godot is doing something it shouldn't, uh, which is causing it to not relinquish input focus uh, when it should. So yes, I absolutely use single window mode because things get even weirder. <laughs> Things get even weirder and worse uh, in not single window mode. And it's 100% like because I'm using uh, i3, which is like not a normal window manager, uh, people who are running like KDE and GNOME do not have these problems. Uh, but it's like X11 with non standard window manager, there's these weird focus issues. So. Gamma Games, welcome to the stream. How's the VS Code integration? I remember the add-on being a lot better when they added the language server, but I haven't tried it in a while. It's really good, honestly. Like, I really like 
the VS Code integration. There's a couple of recent Godot 4 things that aren't represented in the VS Code integration, but that's like just a matter of time before they're they're integrated. Like uh, it doesn't do autocomplete on the um, unique name type things. Uh, so like if I if I try to do a unique name search and I know there's spawn delay timer, it's gonna think that it's there, but it's actually just searching the um, the normal get node thing. Um, I also saw that the uh, one of the maintainers working on the VS Code integration was showing um, some really cool new stuff that isn't released yet, but where you can actually see like the scene tree in VS Code and edit the scene tree from here, which would be really, really cool. So lots of, uh, lots of new good stuff coming. Hey, Cyber Habanero, welcome to the stream. All right, so we were setting up our enemy spawner here. Uh, so how do we want spawn to work? Basically, uh, oh, and we're going to need to keep track of um, how many enemies we are still going to spawn. Uh, we'll call that left to spawn. We'll start it at zero. We'll say if left to spawn equals zero, then we will restart the affair. We'll say left to spawn equals um, the enemy count. And then we are going to spawn an enemy, which uh, I guess will look like this enemy, um, enemy scene instantiate. I'm going to set the enemy, eh, enemy uh, transform to the transform of our spawner. So we can kind of orient the spawner to orient the enemy. And then we are going to add the enemy to the spawner's parent. Uh, add child enemy. Although, yeah, I think I might want to reverse this. So like that. And we need to get our behavior. And this is where the duplicating thing that I'm not sure is going to work. We're going to say behavior equals uh, enemy behavior duplicate. See what happens. <laughs> Um, and we will add that to the enemy. So enemy add child uh, behavior. And we have to do a thing where we say behavior. Uh, we have to set its actor somehow. Um, T root. How do we set your actor in code? Actor path, blah, blah, blah. But how do we directly set the actor? This might not be set up to work from code. Uh, the author of this add-on may not have had this use case in mind. So uh, we may have to do this a slightly janky way. Um, either by messing with the internals of um, this object or by setting the actor path and letting it, you know, uh, grab the actor for us, which we could do since we've added it to the path already. Maybe we'll do that because that's the least uh, likely to go wrong. So say behavior actor path equals enemy get path. And we're going to say behavior enabled equals true because uh, we're going to want the behavior to be not enabled uh, in, the, in the tree, the one that we're cloning. Hey, Andreas Friedel, welcome to the stream. I think this should work.
All right, so then we've spawned one. We need to say left to spawn minus equals one. And then we say if left to spawn is greater than zero, then we are going to kick off our spawn delay timer. Oops. Which Yeah, I might want to break this up into multiple functions just to prevent more things from going wrong. Um, let's do func, ah, func spawn one. And we'll grab the logic for spawning a single enemy here. Then we will call spawn one. And this way we can have the spawn delay timer call spawn one. Or no, because it'll still need to redo it. We may need to still have the spawn delay timer call here. I just don't like the idea that the spawn delay could restart the whole thing. Like, that just seems like I'm asking to have a crazy bug where we just spawn infinitely. Um, well, I could put this logic in here. And we could have a little guard here if left to spawn. Well, no, okay, because it will come down to zero. Let's try this. Let's try this. If there's bugs, there's bugs. We'll fix them. Spawn delay timer. We want to call spawn one. Then I have to do this to make sure that my input focus goes to VS Code, <laughs> um, which I don't remember if I was talking about that before or after the person who was it who was asking about VS Code integration Gamma Games. The, the focus thing that I'm complaining about is a Godot bug. It's not a VS Code thing. It's a Godot bug with uh, only on Linux and only with uh, non-standard window managers. So it's, it's obscure. I'm going to complain about it a lot because it affects me, but uh, it is not a reason to not use Godot or to not use VS Code integration with Godot. Uh, OK, so this should be the code we need for the spawner. Let's go back to our level 1. So now our enemy spawner is going to need to know that it's spawning our prototype enemy, that it's using this particular behavior, uh, which actually I may just put underneath the spawner because it, they're kind of like connected. Um, and I'm going to not have the actor path signed. Uh, what are you complaining about? Yeah, it must be filled, but it's fine. We're, we're not, we don't care. Uh, and then here we have our, our target point and our path 3D, which should have better names uh, for like real level design purposes here, but it's fine for now. I don't like how this gets like white down there. Can I just like... Yeah, let's just do it like this. This is this is better. Um, as far as like, I would rather do level design in this kind of environment. Okay. So enemy spawner. Uh, here's the behavior. Here's the enemy. We want, let's say, 10 enemies. Uh, point two is fine. Start time zero is fine because we're testing. Uh, now let's go back to our main scene and we are going to instantiate our level one that we just started working on. And theoretically, I should be able to press play and see this enemy spawner start spawning a bunch of enemies. Let's give it a try. And it crashed. Uh, invalid index wait time on base timer. I swore that was the name of the property. Let's check it out. Timer. Wait time. Wait time on base timer with value of... Oh, I, you know what it was? It was, me miss, it was me typoing start time versus start timer. The thing that I said moments ago. I didn't like having those two variables named so close to each other. Uh, okay, so let's look for start timer. Hmm. Start timer.
Oh, here we go. So it wasn't that. <laughs> it was just a plain ass uh, problem here. They okay, spawn the delay. Plain ass typo. Not the typo I thought it was. Uh, get instance ID on null value. Well, yeah, you're supposed to be disabled. You're supposed to be disabled. Um, enemy spawner. BT root enabled off. Let's try this. All right. It spawned our an enemy. It's not doing anything. In fact, yeah, it's not doing anything at all. <laughs> What's up with you, enemy? Ooh, okay, so it spawned all of our enemies. And let's go look at the... Well, that's not great. Um... Oh, and here our debuggers filled up with uh, 15,000 warnings. It looks like the problem is that our target point and our path aren't set on these actions. Oh, and they totally aren't set. I guess my copy and paste lost them. When we copy and pasted those from the other scene. All right, let's give this a try now. Oh, here we go. Ah, there's a whole bunch of them. Oh, look at that. Okay, we got to get rid of the debug cube. Uh, but, like, that is essentially what we wanted them to do. I mean, it's all prototype junk at this point, but, like, the behavior is right. Uh, let's go to follow path to get rid of our debug cube. Oh, God. Focus issue. There we go. Uh, print success. We don't need that either. Let's get rid of this. Uh, we don't need to print out this stuff either. All right. They're coming up. And they are going to follow this path magically. Moving in these nice curved motions. Okay, we have to see this in VR. We have to see this in VR. Uh, let's save this. Uh, I'll have to put the headset on. Give me a moment. Oh man, this is weird. I got this new strap for this headset, and uh, I can now not really get the he my uh, headphones on my head. I hope you guys can hear me. Let me get through this. All right, let me know if you guys can hear me, because uh, the headset is so far away from my head. I guess it's still generally pointed at my mouth. That's good. Um, let's go to oculus.com slash cast. I'm using the pass-through cameras. <laughs> uh, nope, I mistyped. Ah, oh, geez. Let's... Awesome. I am glad that my audio is coming through. Come on, Oculus. All right. So let's tell Godot to deploy to the headset, uh, which it's already ready to do, except it's complaining. Oh, OK, because I updated to 4.2.1. All right, we have to download the export templates, and we have to um, Delete something real quick. Oops, that's not where I meant to be. We have to delete the old Android build directory. And once this finishes downloading, it looks like it did. 
it stopped doing things. Er, are installed and ready to be used. You say so, but I don't see them on the list. Um, install Android build templates, install. And then, oh, what I'm going to need to do, well, let's see. It may just work. It seems to be just working. All right. I don't know if you noticed, too, I got this new strap, which has, like, this extra hinge so that I can kind of bring the, the headset up while keeping it on my head, which is pretty cool. All right, I'm in the plane. Let me get casting going here. Uh, why are you not working? Reload? It said it's already casting to another. No, it's not. You're a liar. Hmm. Hmm, well, this is frustrating. It says it's casting in the headset. Oh, oh, here we go. All right. All right, let's see where those enemies got to. Where the heck? Oh, there they are. <laughs> and we can shoot at them a little bit. Won't do anything, but... And can we get in front of them? Yeah, so this would be perfect. Come in here and then you're just trying to take them out. And then they go back there. Okay, yeah. This is effectively uh, how I wanted this to go. I mean, again, and I keep saying this, this is all prototype uh, stuff. We'll get some real enemies. Uh, we'll make it possible to actually shoot them. But here, let's, um, I'm going to launch it from the beginning. I just want to see them come out of the spawner, seek the first point, and then start following the path. So let's go back to here. Since I don't have a reset button in the game, we'll just redeploy. They're spawning, flying away. And then I guess they reach the point there, and rather than coming straight at it, they do that nice curve. And they're coming around here. Yeah. All right. So I think the next thing we need is not have them just loop. So what we want them to do is they spawn, they come up to that point, they loop around, and then we want them to uh, join like a kind of grid, like to, to pull into a formation in front of me, which will then give the player uh, an opportunity to shoot them some more and move around a bit and then uh, let them also periodically shoot at us before then reforming into a line and doing the, the loop a second time. I think that's, that's basically, uh, that will basically prove that we have uh, the, the systems in place that we need, that the behavior tree and the steering behaviors uh, will allow us to build the sort of um, enemy AI behavior that we want. So, sweet, let's dig into that. I'm going to just take the headset off completely because it's it's more comfortable. <laughs> Thanks guys. Yeah, I after just struggling with this so hard last stream uh and losing my mind over the whole week like just taking notes in my notebook and like researching stuff and trying to figure out how can I how can I build this sort of Galaga-like enemy behaviors? I'm super happy with the way this is going. I, I think this is the way. I think this is the way forward. All right. Uh, so let's commit what we've got. 
in my Galga style behavior branch. Did I make a change to this? I don't remember changing the script. Let's just take a look at what changes I did there. Oh, I didn't. VS Code just redid the, the tabs, made them spaces to tabs, probably. All right, we don't need to commit that. Um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna get rid of those changes. Restore staged this guy. And I think I gotta do yep git checkout dash dash dot. All right, so those changes are gone. Let me just look at the other changes really quick just to make sure they're all good. But yeah, I like this. Uh, I, I'm surprised the duplicating. Uh, of the behavior tree worked, but I'm happy that it did because that will make for a very nice uh, level design workflow. Like I said at the beginning, uh, for those who weren't here, my, my goal is to try and create just like a, a 10, 15 minute experience. Uh, maybe that would be like three levels in a boss battle or something. Just, just a real simple thing, uh, but I'll try to make it as complete as I can uh, for those 10 minutes. And put it up on App Lab. That's that's what I really want to do. All right. So, uh, added, uh, or we'll say implemented, enemy spawner, and split, uh, out level one. Okay, so we'll need to add a new uh, action class to our our behavior tree here. How are we doing on time? Oh my gosh! Okay, we only have like 20 some minutes. We might not get super far in the end here. Uh, but we'll say BT action. This action will be, um, we'll say join. Do I want to call it grid or do I want to call it formation? Let's say join formation. Join formation action. And we're going to need something to represent the formation in the world. Um, can we draw like AABBs into the editor? Because that would be really nice. Um, What node would let us do that? I mean, we could use a collision uh, node to do it. I don't know that I want to, though. Um, node 3D. Well, yeah, I mean, I'd prefer to be able to draw it, but even if we can't, we could just make um, a node to represent the formation and add properties that say, okay, this formation is this much tall, this much wide, um, and kind of wing it that way. Um, so yeah, let's make let's add a node 3D, and we're going to call it um, grid formation, and we are going to place it somewhere around where the enemies return to over here. And we need to attach a script. God, I'm gonna have to reorganize this project so bad. Every single script is at the top level and they all follow different naming conventions. <laughs> it's kind of a disaster, uh, but that's that's not a right now problem. I'll, I'll go reorganize everything over the weekend or something. Um, so we need to have some properties. Let's say um, export var would an AABB be the appropriate thing? Or should we just do like an extents x and extents y? Or just an extents, an extents vector 2. Uh, we'll say grid extents vector 2. And we'll say by default, it's 100 by 100 meters which is really small in our world here. I think the play area is 1,000 meters wide and 500 meters tall.
and we want uh, like a grid spacing. How far do we want the enemies to be apart? Um, I don't know, 25 meters. So then this formation, uh, which I really do think we'll actually need at some point like a whole concept of what a formation is in this game, uh, because I don't know if it'll do it in our little bit of watching Galaga here. Um, so the, the enemies do these lines, right? And then they join up this kind of grid formation, which is what we're building right now. But sometimes they also form like uh, little formations out of these ones and uh, come like swoop down in a group of three or something. Yeah, like these ones, these guys, those three that came down like that, those three green ones. But uh, for now, we're just going to have this single grid formation where it's going to keep track of points within the grid so that when the enemies line up like this, it'll say, okay, I have all these different points available. And when one enemy wants to join the grid, it'll just say like, hey, give me a grid point. And then the grid formation will say, here, this one's yours. And then it won't allocate it to anyone else. And uh, the enemies will, will move into their assigned spot. Of course, using a steering behavior, which we'll have to set up uh, to avoid crashing into each other. So they'll say, okay, you get this point, this point, this point. They'll all try to fly there while also applying a steering behavior to, to avoid colliding. All right. So uh, how are we going to keep track? Oh, grip spacing? Grid spacing. How are we going to keep track of the the reservations. So in the end, we're basically just taking the grid extents, dividing it by the grid spacing, and that generates all of our points. But how do we keep track of who has got what point and ensure that we don't double assign points? I mean, we could have an array. We could have a two-dimensional array that keeps each of the points, although that seems like an unnecessary level of complication. Uh, the number of points is likely not super high. I mean, in this grid, in fact, it's four by four, so 16 points. Um, computers can iterate over loops of 16 and compare three floats very, very quickly. Uh, so maybe we just need a list of which points are taken, and then our algorithm for assigning them is basically randomly pick one and then loop over the list and make sure it isn't used. I think that would be efficient enough. Uh, it's possible that at big enough grid sizes or with grids that are full enough, that that could be slow. But it's a good first try. Another thing too, like in Galaga, they kind of line up in a way that seems organized. And I'm assuming in Galaga, they each have assigned spots that they always go to um, because it's a retro game and you know that makes the most sense. Uh, I would like the battlefield to be a little bit more dynamic, though, that the the actions you take when fighting the enemies has an influence on how things play out. Uh, that's you know vaguely noticeable when you when you replay it, just to make everything seem more more dynamic. Um, but we could uh, like allocate things in groups, which might alleviate this problem a little bit. Like we say, okay, we're gonna allocate over here um, and kind of like keep a cursor over there. And then we only do like a, um, like a loop through what is reserved after we've run the cursor all the way to the end. Uh, and that way uh, it should be relatively efficient to assign points. Or actually, the cursor might be a good way to find a free point because um, we will never have to loop more than the number of possible grid positions. So if we have a 4x4 four four grid, 
to find the next available point, we'll never have to loop more than 16 times. Whereas if we're randomly picking it and then uh, saying, oh, is this a valid? No, okay, try another one. And then randomly and pick another one. Oh, this is valid. We could end up looping like a ton of times. Uh, so maybe, yeah, maybe we, we uh, start at... maybe not the beginning, but the last place that we tried, then we assign the next set of positions, and then when we get to the end, we go back to the beginning? I think that's good. That seems like a decent algorithm. Does that make sense to you guys? Or is that dumb for some reason that I didn't think of? <laughs> so we will need a, um, we'll say last position assigned, be a vector two, and so we're going to need to be converting between kind of like relative grid cells and the actual um, positions. And so yeah, actually maybe we won't call that position. This is actually like a cell in our grid, last cell assigned. And so then if we say Uh, and we'll also need to keep a list of assigned cells. I think there might be a flaw in my original logic. Because to check if a cell is assigned, we do still have to go through the whole list of assigned cells. Maybe we do want to have um, an array. We'll do a one-dimensional array. And then this can just be an integer, actually. Does this make sense? Then what are we storing in this array, though? <laughs> I guess true or false. Uh, so we'll need a function for. Um, let's just start with ready. Let's start with ready, and we're gonna say cells resize. We want it to be. Uh, so grid extends divided by grid spacing. Okay, let's get um, so our cell size two equals grid extends divided by, or this will be a vector two i for integer. Grid extends divided by grid spacing. So this would give us four comma four as a result. So then the cells we need to be the cell size x times the cell size y, which gives us the 16 cells. And then when we say like, allocate position, and we're going to return a vector 3. And then we also need to say func um deallocate position for when the uh when they leave the grid okay and we're going to need a way to convert from positions to cells and cells to positions but i guess let's just start writing this function uh so We need an index. We're going to start at the last cell assigned. I'm going to say, oh, okay, so we'll, we'll need to record the start. Okay, 
index equals start. And then we're going to loop. Uh, da, 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 da. Jeez, plus one. Okay, so the index is the cell after the last cell sign. And then we're going to loop over all of the cells. I guess it's actually more like a while loop. While index does not equal start, because we're going to loop around. Say if index is greater than or equal to cells size, that's where we loop. We set the index back to zero. At the end of the loop, we want to increment the index. All right. And we can assign a cell if cells index equals false. All right, so we need to actually assign all of these to false. Is there like a, a method we can use to just fill an array with this, a single value? Fill, fill. There we go. Resize blah fill zero. Perfect. Exactly what we needed. So cells fill false. Okay, so if a cell is false, then this one is good. And we're gonna say um we're gonna assign it to true because we're now reserving it. And then If list of points is long enough and enemies have points fast enough, don't you need to keep track of a point is occupied? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we're, we're, this is so that the cells is attempting to keep track of of which which cells are occupied. I may have to completely rewrite this once I finish it and realize this is a bad way of doing it, but uh, uh, this is the way I'm I'm exploring it for now. If a list of points is long enough and enemies have points fast enough, don't you need to keep track of a point? Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm understanding your question correctly. And I think I'm accounting for it. But if I'm misunderstanding, please let me know. Oh, I misread your message. Okay. If a list of point if list of point is long enough and enemies leave points fast enough, don't you need to track if point is occupied? I don't understand the clean. I um like we're keeping track of if a point on the grid is occupied. We're gonna have stuff in the 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 steering behavior to try and make them not crash into each other. I guess... Explain it to me like I'm a five-year-old and perhaps I will understand. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Uh, so the last cell assigned is going to be this cell. And then we need to convert... Um, we'll say cell to position, and we're going to return that to the caller. Otherwise, we go up. And if we don't get anything, we need some way to indicate that. Uh, how are we going to indicate that if the grid is full? Uh, I guess what we'll do is we'll get rid of this and we'll make the return value nullable. Not the most elegant solution. So func cell to position. All right. And so first we need to get the position relative to uh, this node. So that would be um our x value doing x and y this way so our x value would be modulo y we need to recalculate the cell size we should just store the cell size so our cell size
I assume we have a randomized list of points. You give away points one after another in loops. In this case, you don't need to track if a point is occupied. Uh, so it's not a randomized list of points. We're giving them we're giving them away in order, essentially, um, on a on a fixed grid. Uh, but the the enemies will stay there until they leave or until they're destroyed. So positions will become freed up later, and we we do need to check if if they're occupied. I I might still be totally misinterpreting your your point though. Um, I feel like I'm missing something. So the x would be index modulo cell size y, and the y is b index divided by cell size y. And assuming this does integer math, which it's complaining about, uh, those should be correct. Let me make sure it's doing. Yeah, so it's complaining about the integer division, but I want an integer division. Local variable x is the use. Okay, that's fine. Wish I could just make it stop saying this, but all right. So then this gives us the x and y positions in the grid and turning those into local positions. Say local pose equals um, say vector three. Uh, so we want it will be the or wait, where is zero in this? I think we want zero to be at the center, so we're gonna to need to say negative grid extends x divided by two plus um, x times cell size, not cell size, uh, grid spacing, grid spacing. We only have one grid spacing value, right? Yeah. Um, and then grid extends y divided by negative grid extends y divided by two plus y plus grid or times grid spacing. And then the z value is always zero because we're going to keep it on sort of a flat plane. And then we need to globalize this position based on the position of uh, this node. So this will be the position relative to the center of our grid formation node. And then we need to take that and say global transform times local pose. Oops, I don't need a semicolon because this is GDScript. I did not correctly rename this. All right. This may be total junk, but uh, yeah, we won't worry about deallocating for the moment. We're just going to let them go into this grid, and then they'll just live in this grid. Um, this will at least tell us how wrongly I did this. It's all right. We, we've placed our grid in our level over here. Let's make sure it's at a good height. Needs to be up at, let's say, yeah, our, our 1,200. And actually, yeah, let me move it ahead of where the, because this would be kind of cool if they came around and then pulled into here. Yeah, uh, so uh, I want I want to have this 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 grid exist for the whole length of the the level, and then have uh, enemies move up into this grid uh, periodically, then leave the grid and come back. So like, you, this is the grid, uh, but in 2D form. And then every once in a while, they'll pull out and come shoot at me or whatever. But if, if you don't kill them, they would go back to the grid. Uh, I think Galaga may actually be playing a trick on us where once they go off the edge, they reemerge from the top. 
But uh, yeah, they'll they'll go to the grid, leave the grid, come back to the grid. Different enemies that swoop in will join the grid at later points, uh, like here. And yeah, I don't know. The the Galaga kind of organizes them into these enemy types, uh, so that could maybe be like sep grids that we would have for each enemy type or something like that, but I don't know that we want to do that, honestly. Um, let's let's make this work at all, and then we can sort of figure out what we want to do on a, on a gameplay level. Although we're out of time! Crap. <laughs> it's already 11 o'clock my time. I have a ton of meetings today, uh, so I do have to uh, log off so I can have some lunch, go to my first meeting, whatnot. But this was a good stream, guys. Um, we actually did some things that moved the enemy AI in this game forward in a tangible way. It didn't end on in just frustration and me uh, not knowing how to continue. That's always a good sign. Uh, and yeah, it was always uh, fun as always to hang out with you. So thanks so much for coming. Uh, I hope you all have a great weekend. Uh, if you're heading out on your holidays before the next time I see ya. Happy holidays. And uh, yeah, thanks again, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.